discovery of mass graves at Indian boarding schools has revealed to some of us just how little we know about what really went on there. So for this episode, I've invited an expert, a leading scholar in this field, who's going to tell us what really happened at these boarding schools and what we need to know about these grisly discoveries. Dr. Graham, it is a pleasure to have you on The Lost Legends. Thanks so much. Really glad to be here. Now, uh, Dr. Graham and I met when we were in grad school, and I was uh, studying medieval studies, and people told me, you should be like John Graham. He's studying uh, American history because you can actually find work in American history. And I didn't listen to those people, and now uh, you're a professor and I'm a podcaster. So I guess those people were right. It's a lose-lose situation, let's be honest. And you were working on your book already. It's called Education at the Edge of the Empire, Negotiating Pueblo Identity in New Mexico's Indian Boarding Schools. So way back then, you were already becoming an expert on what we call Indian boarding schools. Um, and that's an issue most of us don't know anything about. Even before this recent issue, most of us couldn't have told you the first thing about it. And some of us have heard about it. We think this sounds like it's pretty serious stuff. Um, but then it turns out, uh, I, I'm speaking for myself, but I know I'm speaking for a lot of people when I say we really don't know much about it. We aren't taught a lot of these things in school. And I imagine that you grew up in a similar situation to me. You weren't told what an Indian boarding school really was. You probably weren't given that information. Uh, so for starters, uh, just how did this even become your specialty? Um, not just studying Native American history, but studying boarding schools. How did you come about this? Um, so in grad school, uh, one semester, uh, one of our assigned books was a book called Education for Extinction, which is sort of one of the major books on, on boarding schools. It's a nice introduction to the topic. <clears throat> and so I had that book rattling around in my head um, as the semester ended. And uh, that summer, uh, Chris, Chris and my wife and I went to visit some, some family friends uh, out near Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, and while I, while I was in town, I, I visited the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. It's a it's a center run by uh, the 19 Rio Grande Pueblos in New Mexico. And I was looking at their displays, and it's a wonderful museum. Uh, and I noticed um, pictures of of Santa Fe and Albuquerque Indian schools. And I did not know those existed. I knew they were boarding schools, kind of like what was discussed in the book Education for Extinction. But I thought, well, I bet. For a variety of reasons, this is sort of a different story. And so I got kind of interested in trying to figure out what was the history of these schools, uh, how did being in the Southwest uh, impact that experience, um, how did it, how did the Pueblo's own history and unique tribal culture um, impact the story, and it just started unraveling, um, or not unraveling, but unfolding, maybe unraveling at times as I was writing it, uh, and we ended up with, with that book published in 2015. So you could say that for 20 years or more, you've been studying and teaching on Native American history with a focus on these schools, what we call Indian boarding schools. Yes, yes, that, that, would, be, that would be accurate. The boarding schools are my specialty within the field. I don't think uh, there's going to be a lot of people who have more experience than you in this narrow field. That's the fun thing about history is you think all of it's been done and then you go and discover there's some vast field that really hasn't been touched or not done enough with. And so that's really neat. And this is an interesting intersection. Uh, there's people who will ask, why study history? And after we you know, punch them and, and drive our cars into those people, we can let them know that you have situations like the one you're in where your field of study is an intersection with social justice. Uh, would, you, would you say that's accurate? I think so. I think anyone who takes themselves seriously as a scholar within Native American history understands that being an ally and an advocate is part of the responsibilities of being in that field. So I really admire something about you, John, which is that you have a lot of passion for this subject, but it's never like a political slant. It's always your passion for showing people the past. And sometimes you have to show people the bad parts so we can move forward. And that's something I think you do really well. Um, uh, where do you teach, John, and what is your, what is your position there? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a senior instructor at Missouri State University in Springfield, Missouri. Been here since 2015. Fantastic. I, I am very thankful that students have someone like you because I know you do good work. 
Um, so what I want to talk about is, first of all, the boarding schools. I can say that I don't know anything about them. And I used to hear of them. Everyone's heard the term Indian boarding school. And I've even heard uh, stories that you might call cute or adorable stories about kids who grew up there and what they made of themselves. And as a kid, I would hear about this and I never questioned what I was hearing. It was just a school, a boarding school. I mean, Harry Potter went to a sort of boarding school, right? So uh, just to go down to the bedrock and really make sure people like me know what we're talking about, uh, what is an Indian boarding school? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so the simplest the simplest definition probably would be a school run for the purpose of assimilating Native American children. Um, so if we think of if we think of education kind of at its foundation as the process by which we become useful citizens, right? We have to understand that for uh, a variety of reasons uh, in the United States, also in Canada, in Australia and other places, um, Europeans and their descendants looked at indigenous peoples and said, you, you are not useful to us. You are not able to be part of our society. Uh, and not only that, but by the way, you're taking up a lot of really sweet, sweet land that we would love to have access to. So how do we solve this problem from their perspective, right, of what they would call the Indian problem, right, which is that you have indigenous peoples who you see as inferior, who cannot help your society, and who are taking up real estate. One possible solution to that that's tried in the United States and in Canada and other places are these boarding schools where you take children from their communities and you spend a, you spend a certain period of time forcibly assimilating them, trying to, to de-Indianize them, right, uh, in order to incorporate them and their land uh, into the larger society. In fact, the... Um, the creator of, of, of the first federally run Indian boarding school in the United States was a man named Richard Henry Pratt, and his saying was, kill the Indians, save the man. That was, that was his phrasing for why the schools existed. You actually are destroying Indianness in order to save Native Americans from themselves, supposedly. So this is a very good answer, uh, because people sometimes tell me these people in history, those people in history had an agenda, and I never know, uh, as you know, when you look at the past, sometimes it's hard to know what someone's motivation was. And sometimes historians argue over the motivation. And this statement you just made, I'm, I'm a little, little stunned right now. I'm a little I'm kind of responding slowly because I'm stunned by that concept, kill the Indian. It, what was it? Kill the Indian, educate the person. Kill the Indian, save the man. Kill the Indian, save the man. That is a <laughs> that's a that's a that's a deep well because not only are we is a person so callously saying kill the Indian, which is problematic enough, save the man as if the Indian is distinct from the man. There's a serious philosophical problem going on there. Um, so that really does tell us that these schools were not just portraying them as bad places; they were designed to remove what you might call Indianness or indigenous culture or whatever, they were designed to remove that. Not to add education, which there's nothing wrong with teaching people to read, but it was for cultural change, make them like Europeans. And uh, that's that's rather depressing. And I don't think most of us knew that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the the kind of the, another heartbreaking layer to this is is even those people who are convinced they were doing something good for the students are so ethnocentric in their viewpoint that they can't um, even conceive of Native Americans as educating their own children. They really see them as uneducated savages. And so it's their, it's their duty. And in fact, some of them would say it's our Christian duty to take these backward, savage, dying out peoples and make something of them that can survive in the modern world. Yeah, it's a depressing thought. Um, because I, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are like me and that they they kind of pictured teaching people to read, for example. That's actually, it sounds like a good idea, right? It sounds like a good service to give someone that skill. And, and we just weren't told uh, how, how things really were. And you mentioned something else we need to go back to. Because I think one of the darkest parts of this is when you said taken away from their families. Because this is, this is huge. Um, tell us more about this because these don't sound like voluntary schools. 
Um, for, for the vast majority of students, it's, it's not volunteering in any sense that we would understand it. Um, at times, students are, are actually kidnapped. Um, more often, there's there's their coercion, right? Uh, so, as the United States is advancing westward, it's disrupting indigenous ways of life. It's um, kind of compelling Native American groups to live um, under under these um, unfavorable treaty obligations. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the United States says, "Well, you know, we decided what's best for you again. Don't worry." <laughs> And we've decided what's best for you is these schools. And so if you don't send a certain number of students, you're not getting any of the rations you were owed under treaties any longer. Um, and so while it would be wrong to say every child is literally dragged from their home to these schools, though that does happen at times, um, certainly there is there is force and there is coercion involved. Even for those parents who... Um, who would say to their children, go and learn what you can um, because we'll need you to help us know how to survive, how to fight this new presence. Um, certainly no one is under the illusion that they're going and getting a free education and isn't that wonderful. Amazing. And I really like this part you mentioned, or I should say I really don't like this part you mentioned about the supplies that were being given to Native Americans. That sure does sound like a nice altruistic thing to do, and maybe for some people it was, but to then hold that hostage and say, we're not going to give you the food you need unless you give us your children. That is an astoundingly evil thing to do. Well, it, it definitely is, and I'm glad you brought it up because um, some people have a misconception, right, about the, these, these treaty rations. Um, the United States, whether through force or fraud, um, really wanted to have treaties in place as a way of sort of justifying westward expansion. And so we could tell ourselves, we don't, we're not an empire like those European empires. We're different, right? We make treaties. We are good civilized people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so the, the way the treaties are supposed to work is to say, okay, we get the land and then this is what we give you in return for the land. This is, this is what we are using to purchase the land and to sort of delude ourselves into seeing this relationship in a certain light. So, um, you know, some people, not you were not saying this, but some people kind of have this delusion that, that federal funding and federal supplies to indigenous peoples even now is like charity or affirmative action, but it's not. It's based on, it's based on the, the, the legal uh, way that the United States claims the continent, which is that we have these treaties and we'll uphold them when we feel like it. Wow. So you're opening up a lot of, a lot of cans of worms here, Dr. Graham. I really appreciate it. Um, part, part of my, uh, I remember studying um, Sam Houston, a very interesting person. I think Sam Houston is one of the most interesting people in all of history. And he had this interesting passion for Native Americans. He, he lived among them as a child. He married uh, a Native American woman, his second of three wives, and spent time campaigning on their behalf. And I always think that's so interesting because I know how many people like Andrew Jackson just thought Native Americans were just, you know, inhuman, that you could uh, do whatever you wanted with them. And so Sam Houston, his, his presence always kind of made me feel a little better. Some people out there were um, doing things right. But sometimes I wonder if, if those Sam Houstons, assuming I'm right about him, if maybe they were a smaller part of the population than I want to believe. It sounds like the whole world was against the Native Americans. Yeah, I, I think this is where you and I as historians try to do our best to let people be products of their own time, right? And so you and I might say, well, given the resources um, in the 21st century and given the lack of social pressure to be racist <laughs> that you and I face, we might be disappointed with where Sam Houston ends up, right, on some issues or people like him. But I think, um, I think for the time period he's working in, for the immense social pressure he's under, for the worldview options that are kind of available to him, you know, I think uh, I think Houston's doing all right, and and there are other people like him, uh, even you know, uh, even people who have a hard time 
the, well, they're certainly not like they're not cultural pluralists. We would never call them that. They do see Native Americans as inferior, and they they do believe they need to be Christianized and learn some things. What's really interesting is even on the one hand, as, as like Christian missionaries or federal agents are um, a destructive force in indigenous cultural preservation and in indigenous life. Uh, it is also some of those same people or types of people who are the strongest advocates who are fighting as much as they know how against the injustices of the federal government on behalf of Native American peoples. And that's that's the weird part of this story. You see these people and you're like, well, that's ethnocentric or well, that's awkward or you really shouldn't say that or that's really damn condescending. But then you see those same people in courtrooms in D.C. saying you can't do this. It's immoral and unjust to the federal government. So... As you know, as a medievalist, history is floppy and messy and never quite gives us as, as easy a lesson as we would like. <laughs> That's the truth. That is the lesson, isn't it? That it's just not easy. So we have this situation where Native American children are being taken away. No question about it. Uh, they are forced into this either by physical force or by uh, holding necessary uh, supplies hostage, um, which I honestly didn't know about until today. Um, so now we know that we know students were growing up. And tell us more about what it was like to be a student. Uh, you know, in these in this situation, if you were a Native American student at one of these boarding schools, what what kind of things uh, would happen? What was life like? That's, that's a great question. And you know, as more and more stories of individual schools are getting told, and as more and more scholars enter the field, we we've realized that, you know, not every school is the exact same experience as you would probably imagine, but we can generalize, certainly for the sake of a podcast, um, <laughs> about some of the experiences they have. Uh, so we might start by just saying, what is your first day like? That might be the best way to start. Um, and on your first day at this school, you are likely going to lose four things. You are going to lose your clothing. Uh, whatever clothing you came to the school in is going to be replaced by military uniforms. These are, for a long time, these schools are run like military schools. Uh, but you lose your clothes. That that cultural identifier, um, you were probably dressed in your very best clothes, and the school has now told you that that's it's not, it's not great. Uh, it's useless. You can have when you go home, but for now, you dress this way. Uh, you lose your clothes. You lose, um, you lose your appearance. Um, a lot of students have their hair cut, right, when they first get to the school. And for many of these uh, tribal nations that are going to these schools, long hair, especially on men, has very real cultural significance beyond what we would really appreciate, um, despite your luxurious mane, yes. Uh, and, so, and so that's another cultural attack. You might say, well, we're doing it because of lies, not that they had lice, you're just saying lice or doing it because it's it's inappropriate or whatever improper, but it's a big it's a big cultural loss. So your clothes, your hair, or appearance, uh, you lose your name. Uh, most of these students get renamed at the schools. Um, either the names are too hard to pronounce for teachers who aren't interested in learning about the culture anyway, <laughs> or they figure, well, you're gonna be part of an American society or a Canadian society, and so you need a you need a new name. And, it, and the names could be just very general names like Mary or John or things like that. But sometimes in the board of school records, especially on the United States side, which I've studied more, um, you'll see the names of like famous heroes or famous figures. So you, you might see a, an Indian boarding school student named Ulysses Grant <laughs> or William Sherman or Julius Caesar. Um, and, you know, in, in, in sort of Anglo-American culture, we we don't necessarily put as much meaning in names as, as other cultures do, but, but our parents named us things for a reason, right? They named us after family members or maybe after Bible characters or whatever, but in, in giving us those names, they, they spoke into what they wanted us to be like, what our futures ought to be, what our character ought to be. And so the schools take that and they give them new names, right? You will not be like your grandfather. You will be like Ulysses Grant. <laughs> That's who you should be like. Um, the fourth thing that you would lose, yeah, it's getting worse. The fourth thing you would lose is your language. Uh, you are forbidden. You're forbidden to speak anything but English at these schools. And punishments for speaking in native languages could vary from school to school. 
Uh, but it was never pleasant, uh, right? It might be a missed meal. It might be locked overnight in the jailhouse. Yeah, they had jails at a lot of these schools for a long time. Um, one survivor of a Canadian residential school uh, records that a sewing needle was shoved through his tongue to remind him not to speak anything but English ever again. Um, so that's just your first day. <laughs> that's your first day. You've already lost four things that are central to who you are and who your people are. Right, already stripped from you. Um, the average school day at that point was usually divided. I'm not as familiar with the Canadian schools, but in the U.S. side, we're, we're divided into um, classroom instruction in the mornings, and then you would do industrial training in the afternoons, right? Because again, we have to remember the the schools are are not benevolent, right? No matter what the people writing them may think about themselves. Um, they're not benevolent. They're designed to make Native American children useful to American society. And so you teach them low wage skills or working class skills because they're going to enter the labor force. That's how they're going to be useful. And there are some exceptions at some schools. For the most part, working class industrial skills is what students are being trained in. Well, that in farming, because to be a civilized person, you have to farm. So. My goodness. That's quite a lot of loss in one day. Would you say that if you lost your hair, your clothing, you might not feel welcome, or you might feel like you didn't want to be seen back home? Certainly, um, certainly many returning students feel, uh, reporting feeling shame. Um, not only shame over changes in appearance, but shame um, because they've, they've missed out on certain really important cultural markers or um, cultural trainings. They feel like they're outsiders, many of them do. And, and the real tragedy, uh, I think, is that for some students, the efforts of assimilation are successful and they actually return home ashamed, not of themselves, but ashamed of their home communities. Uh, who they now have come to see as backwards and uncivilized. And, and, and many returned students are successfully reincorporated by the community, uh, but not all are. And so for many tribal communities, um, a lot of the legacy of these schools is intergenerational trauma uh, of parents and grandparents and great grandparents who went to these schools and who come home um, deeply, deeply wounded by the experience. Hmm. Generational trauma. And if you have a trauma of this, because uh, you went through this, then I mean, it must be, I assume this was sometimes generational. You went through this, you went home, it was a traumatic experience, changes your life for the worse, and then you have to put your own kids on that, on that train. Uh, did that happen? Was this something that people would have to relive when their own kids, you know, went away? Certainly it does happen somewhat. Um, so, within the United States, religious-run boarding schools uh, start very early. Well, they honestly start in colonial times to some extent, but, but U.S.-funded religious schools start uh, in the early 1800s. And then by the late 1800s, the U.S. is opening up its own federally-run schools, and those run, some of them run even to the 1950s or 60s. Is under federal control. Um, uh, uh, the schools that survive in the 50s and 60s are often taken over by Native American tribal nations. So that's part of the part of the 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 good part of the story, I guess, is that uh, the schools don't succeed. Right, there are still Native Americans, and they actually do um, even take over some of these institutions designed for cultural genocide and use them for education uh, even today. But but yeah, there's definitely um, possibility of multiple generations within the same tribal nation experiencing the schools. Um, it's not a one-off thing. I love this part of the story. I mean, I know it's unfair to, to focus on one good thing in the face of a thousand bad things, but the idea that the schools, some of them have been taken over by the victims and said, now we're going to use this to preserve our heritage. That is a wonderful piece of the story. Uh, but that may be the end of our good news for this podcast, because I want to talk about what happened in Canada. Um, not that long ago, we heard about a discovery. A certain researcher was going around with 
a device that can look underground, you know, like radar and see underground. And they discovered what many had suspected they would find at this very large school, uh, bones, a vast collection of bones. And there was great uproar on, online, and there should have been. Um, at the same time, while this is very disturbing, I have to admit, once again, I don't, I don't really know enough about the situation to really know what it means. And that may, might make me sound a little ignorant, but until these stories came up, I'd kind of forgotten that Indian boarding schools existed, and I hadn't really ever given it much thought. Even as a historian myself, it just just didn't come up. And all of a sudden, I realized, oh, that. Yeah. And I thought to myself, what, what are those? I, I don't even know. So now that we kind of understand, uh, there's not a lot of middle ground here. These are not good places. And even the most well-intentioned you know, European types in these places were doing bad things. And kids who went there were being traumatized. So now we know that no two ways about it. These are bad places. Uh, tell me, what does it mean to find this humongous discovery of bones? Yeah, so to speak to your last point, I think I think it is important to be unequivocal in our understanding of what these schools um, did, right? I mean, there are there are some positive boarding school stories out there for sure, but I think the reason that there are positive stories is that at times students or communities were successful in pushing back against the intention of the schools, right? Where, where you see where you see good stories happening it means the schools weren't functioning as they were designed to function, right? And that's really, really important to understand. Um, to speak to your question about, about the grades, um, the, the boarding schools are woefully underfunded. Um, and because they are underfunded, and at least on the U.S. side of the border, the only way to get more funding is to have more students. They are overcrowded. They are unsanitary. Um, nutrition <laughs> is often an issue. Um, basic medical supplies are an issue. And so what you end up with is places that are not really healthy. Um, and, and even before we add in stories of brutal corporal punishment or even sexual assault, these are already just fundamentally unhealthy places for children to be. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's not, it's not that they were actively trying to kill children, but that it was a place where it would have been very hard for children to stay healthy. And certainly direct actions of the schools do lead to deaths at times. And um, sometimes students' bodies are sent home, um, but often they're simply buried on site. And so uh, on the U.S. side of the border, uh, we just got from the, from the Department of the Interior uh, a, a preliminary report on the federal run boarding schools and on the grades and deaths there and just in their preliminary report they've already found i think 500 graves in just a few schools and so what's what's terrible about the mass grave story is that no one who studies the schools was surprised and when i saw 500 on the u.s side my first thought was, wow, there is so much more to find. Um, so these graves are a result of the school's just daily operations. These are not fundamentally healthy places for children. Interesting. So I ask, and I realize how ignorant I sound asking why, why are dead children a bad thing? Obviously, that's a bad thing. Uh, but, you know... I always, I always, historians must play the devil's advocate. Historians must look at every point of view because no one else will. And so you tell me there's bodies and I think, well, you know, of course there's a cemetery. It's a very large place. Um, I don't know the first thing about how these are run and how many people, you know, pass away of a sickness in a year, how many passed away over in a certain amount of time. So I, you know, I was so curious to know why am I, and, and the news does a, a rotten job of explaining anything. So I was, I'm glad to have you here. So what you're telling me is that with these people, there's a couple of problems that you've highlighted. One is that these kids were stolen. That already changes the whole picture. Uh, and since it's an unmarked grave, what that means is that parents didn't ever find out what happened to their kid. The kid just disappeared. It's gotta be heartbreaking. So this tells us just, and you're saying this is a piece of the puzzle, not the whole puzzle, but we can just think about what it'd be like to find out that a certain school let 500 kids die without telling anybody what happened. And 
even if, let's just be really devil's advocate here, if it was a smallpox outbreak or something innocent, to not even pass the word along that the child had, had passed away is already such a crime. But what you're saying is that these deaths are the direct result of the schools being run in a way that wasn't designed to keep them alive. It was being run in a way like they were animals and they died sometimes and no one seemed to care. That's, that's what you're telling us was really going on. Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing is you could look and say, okay, in this region of Canada, this region of the United States, you know, if you have 20 students die of smallpox at the school, how many died in the whole state, right? And you can kind of approach it that way and say, were students more likely to die at the schools than other places? Um, but I, I think what's better uh, is to look at it and say you've got students who uh, have been taken from their families. So that's, that's a real trauma that affects their physical condition, right? Um, they are in unsanitary places. They are being fed food that they are not used to. It is not part of their culture. It's not what their bodies are used to. So it's not even when you're even if you're trying to do nutritious food, it's not really the best food. Um, yeah, and and so it, it's it's not that it's not even that there's a there's a callousness there. I mean, they are the parents are being informed of students die for the most part, even though they're just being, the bodies are being buried in unmarked graves. But it is. Even in the face of death, even in the face of, I mean, you were burying a child that you took from their home in the ground and you were still telling yourself it is better off that they came here. Even if death was the price, at least for a while, they had the hope of being civilized, <laughs> of maybe being Christianized because a lot of the Canadian schools were religiously run. And that, to me, is the stunning part of it. And unfortunately, that's been the argument re re that's been repeated um, even by modern commentators in a lot of these stories. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, there's graves. There's graves everywhere. Everybody dies. And But at the end of the day, there is, uh, to me, a, a, a terror, a, a soul-chilling terror of being in a place where you can take a small child who has died away from home away from their parents, terrified, and say it was still good that you were here. Yeah, absolutely. Soul t chilling terror. Absolutely. So because you said it before, the point was to kill the Indian, save the man. And in this case, they would they were thinking maybe uh, we couldn't save the man, but at least we killed the Indian. And to say that over the body of a child uh, just demonstrates the, the the level of prejudice that was so prevalent. And it's hard for me to wrap my mind around it. I mean, maybe a way of, of getting at the mindset is thinking about um, thinking about like a, a risky but potentially life saving operation. So someone comes in with the cancer of Indianness. And you know they can't live with that. You must kill the Indianness in them, right? Cancer kills. You got to get rid of it. And it's a really, really risky surgery. And not all the patients survive. But you were still morally right to at least try the surgery. It would have been inhumane. It would have been morally wrong to just let them die of Indianness. You had to at least try. And so every dead child buried by the school is at least a life-saving surgery that you tried. If you want to think of it that way. Yeah, that's that's tough. That's tough stuff to think about. I remember a very sobering conversation I had with another historian who studies colonial history. We were discussing slavery and how it's hard it's hard to understand what it, how you could justify the things that were done in slavery. How could someone be a part of it? And, you know, sometimes a person seems otherwise like a good person, and then we discover they own slaves, and we're so confused. And we see people watching children die. And some of them, as you said yourself, we might think they were good people. They might have thought they were good people, and here they are, watching children die and not caring. And I remember saying to this guy, gosh, you know, that's it's so hard to understand it. Do you think, and he was a historian, a PhD working on some uh, something about Texas history. I said, do you think you would have been a, an abolitionist if you were alive in those days? And he said, you know, I wish, but I'm sure I wouldn't. He said, I'm sure I would just go along with it like everyone else. And this is why it scares me. 
because he's right, because it's a rare person who stands up against everything that's going on. And I think about how evil this is and horrible it is. And then I wondered, goodness, could I be guilty of something just as bad? You know, in a hundred years, will people look at me and say, how on earth did Adam Jones possibly overlook this thing he was doing? Uh, that may be a little too philosophical for our historical discussion, but that's one of the reasons this is so frightening is because it shows us just how, how wicked people can be. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I think this subject would be easier to understand if they were all just cynical bastards using the schools as an excuse for what they really wanted, right? And certainly, again, the land grab is part of this story, but when you read the diaries or you read the letters of some of these people, um, the terrifying thing is that they sound a lot like you and me. They want to help. Mm -hmm. They want to make something right. They see people they assume are dying out, and they want to save them. Uh, and that, to me, is the most sobering lesson of studying these things as someone who is not indigenous, is that to read these these white people who say to Native Americans, we want what's best for you. You're like, that's a little concerning, right? But we want what's best for you, and we know what that is. This is what you need, mm -hmm. and we will give it to you even if you don't understand why you need it. Yeah. We will make sure you get it because otherwise you will die out, and we will save you from yourselves. So that that um, patronizing spirit, that ability to treat people not like us like they're children, right, is very much a spirit alive. Uh, even in in white advocates today, right? I mean, who look at maybe Africa or Asia and say, we've got to help these people. But behind that, we've got to help these people is these poor backwards children need us. And so we look back at the past and we're like, we would never be that racist. <laughs> we would never do that kind of thing. We're good people. We're good. And we delude ourselves into thinking that somehow we don't feel the white man's burden too. Yeah. Um, and that's what keeps me up at night sometimes is <laughs> am I advocating or am I actually just adding to the problem? And I don't know. I hope I hope the former. Yeah. But history may not be as kind to me as I am to myself. <laughs> that's a very deep and very responsible thought to have. Uh, and I always think that when when in doubt, we can simply learn. I think that what you do to teach people history as objectively but passionately as you can does a lot of good. And uh, just the fact that I don't even, I didn't even know what an Indian boarding school was till today helps me to understand one iota of what a Native American community understands. I don't understand their struggle, but I know just a little more. And I can, when you understand someone a little more, when you can start to see yourself in them and feel for them, that really helps. Helps us to make better decisions, I think. So I, I think you're doing great work. Um, let's talk, see, this story has kind of grown, and I think you may have already touched on this, but as usual, the news will just tell you one thing. There was a discovery of bones, and then it's forgotten. Uh, so not only do we not really get any, any expert understanding of it, but also if there's developments, we don't hear about it. So um, has anything come up, you may have already covered this, but has anything come up since the initial discovery that you think maybe got swept under the rug or that maybe would just be good for us to know? Yeah, so on, on, for, on the Canadian side of things, uh, they are much further along than us and dealing with the legacy of these schools. So uh, even though um, the, the shock and horror of the mass graves uh, is very, very real, um, Canada already knew it had a serious problem on its hands <laughs> when it comes to its residential schools. And in fact, they... Um, they had a, um, a truth and rec reconciliation program where they actually interviewed many, many survivors and tried to figure out what had happened. And that process has its own issues, of course, right, uh, and its own agendas. Um, but at least they're trying to tell the story, right? Whereas on the United States side, I mean, I, re I, I asked my students the first day of, well, the first day of class, but when we get to this topic and in our courses, how many have you even heard of these schools? And like maybe two or three of 40 raised their hand, right? And that's just like, do you know what the, I'm talking about at all? Um, one really good development, I think, coming out of this 
is that Deb Holland, who uh, who is Pueblo, and she she is the Secretary of the Interior, has uh, has launched an initiative to study and understand the federal schools, at least on the United States side of the border. And they just released their initial report. Um, I think I think in early May. And so this is huge, right? Because this is actually the federal government trying to understand what it did to Native American peoples. So, so hopefully the, the, these reports and these efforts will lead to, to chances for, for the truth to be known, for information to be more widespread, and for some sort of reconciliation, restoration, maybe even some small sense of justice um, to to be available to to hurting communities who still exist and are still dealing with the fallout of these policies. So I remember watching a movie once called Smoke Signals, uh, stars Gary Farmer, um, and it is. Um, no, I'm no expert, but it was the first time. I'd ever seen a, uh, a reservation. Now I realize it's a it's a movie. It was made by uh, largely Native Americans, so I realize it's just a movie. But it also is uh, supposedly a little more honest look at it. And what's interesting is not only the life on the the reservation, but my realization that I didn't know anything about reserva- about reservations. I couldn't told you a single thing about them. I still can't say much because that movie's <laughs> almost all my knowledge. And I'm really glad that there's people, uh, you know, championing these films and making them when they can. So, so you mentioned we have neighbors who who still live in Native American communities, and I, I just realized, you know, I don't know the first thing about them. None of us really do, and that's a weird that's a weird part of being uh, a citizen of the United States is we have these tribes. They're also considered to be uh, sovereign nations. They live on reservations, which uh, involve uh, a lot of um, involve a lot of government aid, and it's something that I don't think many people understand. I'm not going to ask you to explain reservations and and sovereign nations to us today, but um, you know the fact is most of us were just very unaware of their existence or we've heard of them, but really couldn't say much about them. So I'm curious uh, for those of us who really are reeling from our own ignorance, what sorts of things uh, would be useful for our neighbors who are indigenous people? What would be useful things that we might do or useful things we could support that our leaders could do? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, one one thing that you could do is, is visit. Visit some of the reservations. Um, often reservations will have certain ceremonies or certain parts of reservation open to the public. It's not true across the board. Right, and, every, and reservations can be very different from each other, depending on if there's like oil, for example, or casinos involved. But but visiting um, visiting tribal websites, learning information is is really really good. And I think too, part of it is kind of fighting our own stereotypes. I, I may be wrong on the census numbers. I think about third of Native Americans now live off reservation. They, they they work with us. They go to school with us. They are our teachers, our doctors, um, right? And so we miss that. They sort of hide in plain sight, if you will, because we're still fighting certain stereotypes, right? Well, I didn't know you were Native American because you weren't wearing a headdress. How was I supposed to know? Native Americans don't wear blue jeans or suits. That's not part of your culture, right? So so I think combating our own ignorance um, and and ha- kind of having fresh eyes to look at it and say, okay, you know, Native Americans are part of the urban population in the United States just as much as they are um, still dwelling on, on these on these sovereign uh, land entities. Um, the the Native Boarding School Healing Coalition is an excellent nonprofit that is doing a lot of really really good work in trying to find these schools, uh, find their find the historical records. Um, bring healing and restoration to survivors, learn survivors' stories, uh, and they are very open um, to support from non-natives. You can get money, you can um, you can purchase T-shirts, you can go attend conferences, right? And I think as long as, as posture for non-natives is, I'm coming to be quiet, to shut up and learn, I'm here to see if there's a way I can help with the solutions that you propose, not to offer my suggestion. And I think there's a very real role for non-Native allies in this process still. 
wow. I remember one time going, uh, I was somewhere where I heard some drums, which sounds like an odd thing to say. And I, I walked toward it. I could hear these drums, doom, 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 a steady beat. And I saw people dressed as Native Americans, historical Native Americans. And it was actually um, people from local tribes gathering together, um, I guess just to celebrate that, you know, celebrate their heritage. And they were different groups, but they didn't, they shared the space. And what was interesting to me, what you're saying about the fact that you can, you can go to a reservation, you can go to these different things, uh, usually. And it was the most open, inviting atmosphere. And I don't know where some of us got the idea that we're supposed to keep our distance or something, but I thought, this is amazing. They're, they're so happy to share their song with us. And it was, it was very fascinating to hear. And it was the first time I thought to myself, well, these are my neighbors and I, I they come, <laughs> they're, they're right here. I just didn't know. So uh, it's interesting. There is quite a lot of access that is available to us. And I guess we're just not really aware of it. Yeah, especially uh, you, you probably you probably saw a powwow where, where you are in Dallas. There's a very, very strong uh, urban Indian community uh, and they do a lot of really good programming activities. And, you know, I, I think you're right that there's this sort of this sort of fearfulness that we don't want to be offensive or be rude or something. But, you know, I think in my in my experience, at least if you go with the posture to listen and you don't ask inappropriate questions or if you're told you you can't know something, you don't keep asking, <laughs> you know, it, it, then I think, I think Native Americans are open to sharing their culture, to sharing their history. They want, they want people to know. Something I've noticed is a lot of people like me are raised to think Native Americans look a certain way. And then I've learned uh, the hard way that there's actually quite a variety in the appearance of people who are Native American. And that's helped me to understand, uh, you know, a little bit more about my neighbors. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, part of what we inherited from our ancestors is that the United States divided people uh, into categories of race, right? And so they saw Native Americans as a race and they obsessed over things like blood quantum, how much Indian blood is in you, right? Because they believed that blood actually carried moral mental capacity. And so we, so if you're used to thinking of Native Americans as a race, then you expect a certain look. But for, well, I, I will say that some Native American tribal nations do use blood quantum in determining citizenship and belonging. I would say that for most tribes, there has to be some sort of a political and cultural identification too, right? Some sort of sense of um, dedication to the community, dedication to the culture. Uh, and this is where a lot of Americans get in trouble, uh, and even honestly, federal judges get in trouble, is understanding that um, politically, Native Americans are not a race, they are sovereign nations living within the United States. Not fully sovereign, because the United States denies them some aspects of sovereignty, but it's not another race. Right, and so I, and so that's been in the news a lot with the Indian Child Welfare Act, and not to go off on a tangent, but multiple federal judges appointed by Trump have been trying to argue that it violates the Fourteenth Amendment because it because of race. And it's like, well, no, it has nothing to do with race. These are sovereign tribal peoples um, who have their own definitions of citizenship and their own definitions of belonging. And so, yes, like the Cherokee, for example, uh, one of the main ways, well, I shouldn't say the main ways, they trace citizenship back to um, a series of documents that were created in the late 19th century called the Dolls Roll. And so um, you could have the appearance of being white while being a full Cherokee citizen, because that's how they've chosen to define citizenship, which they're allowed to do, because again, they're a sovereign tribal nation. <laughs> Dr. Graham, this has been very useful, at least for me. And I know that in general, we, as a country, we just aren't really taught these things. And this is why people like you are so valuable because you're really giving us the missing pieces of our education with these little talks and I appreciate it. You happen to run one of the few places on the internet where a historian speaks to normal people as if you are a normal person. And uh, tell us about, about your website, where we can go, because I think it's something everyone should look at. Sure. So I run a, I run a blog called, I call it Telegrams, because I like puns and I'm a terrible person. Um, but the actual address 
is is John R. Graham, J O H N R G R A M dot blogspot dot com. You can tell it's professional because it's blogspots in there. But uh, I started Telegrams because what I noticed um, was lacking in public discourse and in was accessible expertise. And that's what I wanted to provide about current affairs. Accessible in the sense that it wasn't full of academic jargon or things no one understands, even if you are an academic sometimes, but also expertise in the sense that it was something written by a professionally trained historian. So I'm not like, you know, not to be mean, but I'm not a YouTuber. I'm trying not to talk in ways that historians talk, which is uh, often pretentious and annoying and not really as successful as, as we think. <laughs> mm -hmm. I remember once a, a, a scholar at an event I attended, a scholar was asked a question from someone who was watching uh, one of those crackpot shows on the History Channel. And they asked him if this crackpot show was telling the truth. And they were really earnest. I mean, I really thought this was a sweet person who had a, who had a, a real interest in this subject, but unfortunately had been watching irresponsible TV. And the scholar spoke back in the most condescending terms about actually criticizing the way that TV host dressed, but never discussing the facts. And this very kind participant said, I understand you don't like the way he looks, but could you talk about this claim he makes? And I don't think the History Channel shows, no matter how irresponsible, or sure are fun to watch, uh, and they're easy to get caught up in. So I just thought, what an opportunity he missed to share with her, you know, more of the past. But all he did was criticize and move on, never uh, dealing with the facts. And so, you know, it's a shame how many people do that. And we like to say that people shouldn't think that scholars are arrogant jerks, but some people in the field are. So I'm glad you're running this site called The Telegrams. People can search for John Graham, The Telegrams, or go to johnrgram.blogspot.com. And the education you get there is better than what you'll get just about anywhere. Uh, Dr. Graham, it's a pleasure. I think you've uh, done an incredible service to us today, and I can't thank you enough for being on the show. Thanks, Adam. Would you mind if I left your audience with a few book recommendations? I think that'd be great. Go ahead. What should we be reading, Dr. Graham? Well, the, so the boarding school field is it's a really, really big one. It can be kind of hard to jump in. But um, indigenous scholars, Native American scholars, have done so much excellent work on the schools. And they've written a couple of books I think are really good introductions. Uh, I was about to show you the book on a podcast. It's not very helpful to show you the cover. But one of them is called uh, Boarding School Seasons by Brenda Child. Uh, and the other one is called, uh, they called it Prairie Light by Shanina Lomoima. And both those books are, are fairly cheap on Amazon. They're fairly thin. And they're a way to kind of dive into the stories of some specific schools and see, see the humanity of the students and see the way that they persevere in light of the purposes of these institutions. So uh, Native scholars, I think, are, are a great way to understand this topic. All of the books that Dr. Graham has mentioned will be in the description of this episode along with links where you can buy those books. Like Dr. Graham said, hearing from the voices of the indigenous people is absolutely the most valuable way to learn, so I encourage you to check that out. Don't forget to visit AuthorAdamJones.com to sign up for the mailing list and get more great stories like this one or to read my books. That's all for this episode. I'm Adam Jones and you've been listening to The Lost Legends. 